can one person redesign the economy or make sustainability reality? I think being from the Isle of Wight, that sounds a bit too big time, even for a TED talk. So I want to start with something a little more relatable, or at least with something that we've all got in common. And that's that we were all kids once. And when I was five, my mum explained to me how bins work. And at that age, I think the whole world is like a massive game that all the adults are playing in it. And putting stuff in the bin is one of those grown-up rules you've got to learn and follow. And this is how it works. We take all the material and all the packaging and all the stuff from everything that we buy, make, produce, use, consume, and we stick it in this special plastic bag. And then a lorry comes around and each home throws their bag in the back until it's full up. And then it drives away and over a hill and reverses into a field. And then when nobody's looking, we dump all of that into the ground and then we run away. That's what we do. And when I learned for the first time that, like, that's it, that's our system, obviously I started crying. <clears throat> and then I decided I was going to do something about it. So I took out my pencil case and I started writing a letter to the person responsible. And here it is. It says, Dear Mr. Binman, I am five years old. I am very worried about lots of rubbish. Will there be enough room for me in the world when I'm a granddad? And I actually got a reply and they said, you know, don't worry. By the time you're grown up, this is going to be a non-issue because we're working on this thing called recycling. And so I did exactly what they said and followed the recycling instructions on the packaging my entire life. And later, nearly two decades later as a student, I got to go to a waste management center uh, on a field trip. And we came over the hill and there was the lorry reversing and dumping the trash into the ground. And I realized that it had been every day, every year, everywhere, ever since I wrote that letter. And I sort of just felt sorry for the person I had to reply, because obviously they're doing their best, but also they're clearly out of their depth. And not through lack of trying, it's just they're kind of drowning, trying to hold back this tsunami of everybody else's trash. And here's like a snapshot of what they're up against, just something simple like clothes. We're all wearing them. 60% of clothes are made out of plastic. 99% of textiles waste, this is a fact, it's not recycled, it's landfilled or incinerated. And that equates to a flow of 40 tons burned or buried every second. Now seeing what that looks like real world with my own eyes made me realize that whatever I was going to do in my life, I didn't want to be a part of that. And when it comes to these sustainability conversations, I think like a lot of young people, my brother and I, we're kind of done talking about it. We want to do something about it. And we get told constantly, don't we, like, as consumers, or oh, change what you buy then. Educate yourself. Make better choices. Do your bit. So when we went and tried to do our bit and buy products made from, like, organic materials or products made using renewable energy or products that are designed in such a way that they don't eventually end up in landfill, it's like they don't exist. And actually, the more we looked, the more we learned that almost everything in the world seems to be made in like the exact same way. I think the model is almost like this giant conveyor belt where you take resources out of the environment and turn it into products that are designed at the other end of the conveyor belt to be thrown away in the, in the dump. Now, if there's only one option, linear consumption and waste, how is a choice with one option a choice? For us, if we couldn't find the products we wanted to see in the world, it felt like the only option was to make them ourselves. And I think we were like really naive at this point, but we thought it was going to be like really easy. <laughs> I mean, like t-shirts for a start are so simple. But more important than that, we're trying to do a good thing. And you do the right thing, you get rewarded. That's what they say. Yet we took our first positive steps in this direction. It felt like the system itself gave us this hardcore smackdown. And I want you guys to think about what I'm saying here for a second. The more we used clean materials, the more we used renewable energy, the more expensive it got, the more we are punished with cost. Yet if we'd have opted to use polluting materials or chosen fossil fuels, we'd be rewarded. And you still are rewarded with lower prices. So stopping pollution, punished, but polluting is rewarded. Like, we all cool with that? 
I'm not a politician, and uh, we didn't think that we could just change that fundamental in one go. We're actually just two teenagers in a shed at this point. Um, so we decided we would just go out and see what we could change ourselves. And that's how we ended up in places like this, in a factory. I actually really like this photo because it shows for me what working in sustainability actually looks like. It's not about taking photos of people and showing how things are made. It's about working with people to try and change how they're made. And when we went to and worked in places like this, we just kept seeing the same thing everywhere. Waste. And I'm not talking about waste on the floor or like wasted time or wasted electricity. I'm talking about the waste built into the business model itself. For example, in the fashion industry, something like 40% of all production is never utilized. Now, that's a fancy way of saying it's manufactured, then landfilled, without ever having really been worn or used. And it turns out that's because these products, like most products in the world, are produced speculatively. Now, if you start making stuff before anyone's actually ordered it, you have to guess what to make. And guessing guarantees waste. So if you have a model based on wasteful overproduction, then you scale it to mass production, you end up with massive amounts of waste. And for us, as like noobs, we're like, this is insane. <laughs> Why don't producers just produce what people need when they actually need it? But it turns out there's some understandable excuses that explain why people don't normally do that. It would mean producing things one at a time in real time and at a speed and scale that would require like hundreds of people looking after thousands of processes, making millions of decisions, like round the clock, 24-7, almost at the speed of light. Basically, people's minds just cannot process that much information. But a computer can. And when we made that connection, that's something that we acted on. We started looking into digital printing and digital equipment because you can connect digital things to computers. And on, you can connect computers to the internet. And on the internet, you can learn to code and write code. And with code, you can sort of see how these zillions of little processes could be digitized and automated. You can sort of see how you could solve this problem for good. And then we made a discovery uh, here on the Isle of Wight, uh, an abandoned supermarket. And this was our, if not now, then when moment. So we borrowed some money and we bought it. And we started uh, building our own factory inside it. So this is a look inside. Rich is holding a product at the end of the production line in fresh water. And it's just been made, but in the seconds after somebody ordered it. I said earlier how, like, speculative overproduction produces massive amounts of waste. Well, not doing that saves massive amounts of money. We save so much money, in fact, we can afford to use the organic materials we want to use, and we can afford renewable energy and sustainable packaging, and even pass some of those savings back to our customer to make sustainable products affordable for everybody. Progress. This is our recipe for progress. Redesign a business model, if that's what it takes, but eliminate waste, and then spend what you save on sustainability. And everywhere there's waste, there is an opportunity to do that. So if we're looking for big opportunities to move forward, where are the biggest piles of waste in the world? Well, back to landfill. And stood on the edge of a landfill, it doesn't take long, I think, with that frame of mind to realize that maybe the word waste is like part of the problem. I mean, you can tell if you say what you see, like steel or aluminium or paper. I think we use words like trash, maybe, so it's cool to treat it that way. But these are materials, and materials are worth something. And I always find it surprising, actually, that producers themselves haven't acted on this. Like, how weird is it that, like, a drinks company goes out and uses their capital to buy, say, like, polyethylene for the bottle they put their product in? And then they sell it to thirsty people, but give those people no choice other than to throw that in the bin, giving themselves as a producer no choice but to go and take the money they just made and use some of it to replace the material they already had to begin with. I mean, if material is money, every time they sell something, they throw money in the bin. From what I know about business, this is not a very intelligent way to play the game. 
Uh, it trashes the environment too, by the way. Um, but stupid games, stupid prizes. And we just didn't want to play that way, basically. So we made a decision to design every product that we ever made to come back to us when it was worn out. The idea was to make new products from the material that we recovered. And we developed some tech uh, to help us do that. I can take my phone and when it's time, scan the label inside this t-shirt right here to activate the free post recovery process. It's easy. And it needs to be more than just easy. But because we've designed the products in such a way that this material is worth something to us, we can afford to pay people for doing that, to reward them. And then material starts to flow. But not to landfill, back to us, the maker, to be remade, resold, and reworn. And I think, to me, that's what this design thing's meant to be all about, isn't it? Not just designing like lots of different products, but designing fundamentally different outcomes. But things don't design themselves. People do. I think people get inspired by things they see, so I want to show you guys something. The whole time we've been talking about waste, um, you've been looking at it but not on the slides, I'm wearing it. The shirt that I'm wearing is made out of old shirts. And when it's worn out, it will come back to us to be remade back into a new shirt again, again. So this idea that maybe the future might be something called circular economy, this is what circularity looks like for real today. Now, if we want that to be like the solution, we need to scale it up. Because the solution needs to be as big as the problem, otherwise it won't work. So we, the fastest way to do that basically is on the internet these days. So we decided to package all this tech up and put it online in our platform and give it away for free. It basically means that anybody can design and sell their own products but connected to our digital infrastructure that we've built. You can start a brand basically but on a circular model from day one. And literally anybody can do it, it's free. You guys could use it if you want. Even our competitors can use it. And after a couple of years, something like 10,000 brands, businesses, charities, events are using t -Mill. I think the cool thing is that together we're all using a more sustainable means of production. And while people say that in our economy there's like one force that drives it forward, drives progress, that's competition. In my experience, we got way further, way faster with cooperation. So in the end, I think we can all be guilty, maybe, of thinking about the economy as this like rigid rule set that's like applied to us. And we talk about those rules like we're just players. But if we're not happy with it, we need to ask like who makes those rules? And you know, I, I think it's a lot like that experience growing up where you're a kid and all the adults have everything under control and then you become one you realize nobody's in control, <laughs> or like scary version, is it meant to be me? <laughs> Am I in control? <laughs> the economy is not something that happens to us. It is us. It's just a word for the playground where all of our ideas and our actions play out, and anybody can create and contribute. Next time we want to ask and challenge with a question, it's totally OK and cool to actually build the answer yourself. And it's meant to be fun. So if there are parts of it that are not, who's to say we can't reimagine what that might look like? Not just new products, but new business models too, the places where products come from. Now I'm not saying that we won't upset a few people if all of us here just like bust out here and come up with a new idea of what business as usual might look like. But if the economy is a big game made up by all the adults, there's no rule that says that we can't. Change the rules, move the pieces around, and change the game. So I'm all grown up now. If I see something I want to change, I know exactly what to do. I take out my pencil case, and I start writing. <clears throat> but not a letter, a plan. <laughs>